and get on top of this stuff, shall we? All right, so today we're talking about synthesizers. Uh, you downloaded the synth, the Tyrell N6. If you haven't downloaded it, make sure you go download that so you can follow along with this video. You can just do a search for Tyrell N6 download and it will take you there's like a couple links you can jump through but you'll get there and I can put the link maybe in the description of this video as well but uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about synthesizers and the basics of synthesis so the pictures that you see on here are gonna be a little bit different maybe some of them because I don't think there's any pictures that are using the Tyrell N6 but it's all the same stuff and the important part when you're learning about synthesizers is not that you're trying to go one-to-one -one for things it's more of a general overview of stuff and the concepts there are some words vocabulary that are the same across all synthesizers but even those kind of change a little bit there are some similarities and we'll talk about all that stuff here uh, today so basically first of all what is synthesis synthesis is the creation of sound by an electronic means uh, using synthesizers which is an electronic musical instrument and there are many types, styles, and sounds. That's one of the things about synthesis is there's so much variety out there. It's pretty mind-boggling. The very first synthesizer that was ever created was a uh, well, synthesizer. The very first electronic instrument that was made was a thing called the theremin. It was made by a guy named Leon Theremin. This is back in the 1910s, so like 1917 or 1918. And basically, he was a Russian scientist who took technology that he was using for mine detection they were like a like a like a, like a metal detector thing they were using to make mines and he realized that you could take that and you could use it with the human body to create sounds uh, and pitches and you could learn how to play it. and it's a really cool instrument that's like kind of it's like the one where people hold their hands in the air and they, they go towards this metal bar and it gets higher or lower uh, here let me just go ahead and show you a picture of a theremin theremin instrument. So here's what a theremin looks like. You can see this lady here is she's got her hands in the air and the this there's two bars here. Oops, let me go ahead and there we go. There's two bars here. This bar here is your pitch and this bar down here is your volume. And the closer you get to this bar here, the higher or lower the pitch goes. And the closer you get to this bar down here, the louder or softer the note plays. And by using your hands in conjunction with each other like this, uh, you can create really musical tones, very much like a violin. But also like a violin, these things are crazy hard to play. It's not like a like a synth where you can just put your fingers on it and hit the same key over and over again because the the distance between your fingers and the bar right here really makes a difference in how how like the pitch and so it's it's really hard to control I've, I've never actually owned a theremin I played with them a couple times here and there but uh, it was super super hard and I was like you know what I don't really have the inclination to learn how to play this thing. I have friends who had them on stage with their bands and stuff. They used to play in like these kind of electronic rock bands and they would just have them and they would kind of make a boo and just use them for crazy sound effects and stuff. And it was really cool. Um, but to play it really musically and like precisely, it takes a lot of control. Uh, there's a really, really cool YouTube video. I'm not going to play it, but I can go to it here. YouTube dot com uh, YouTube video of crazy theremin no crazy theremin skills no this one here Gnarls Barkley remember that song Gnarls Barkley uh, this is amazing and you need to watch it this this uh, crazy this dude Randy George uh, it's amazing and you need to go watch it don't go watch it right now because you should be paying attention to my to me, but definitely go uh, play it. Um, Plugin Alliance is giving away six plugins for free. Ooh, Plugin Alliance. Sign up and receive six free plugins. Oh, Brainworks! Nice. I think I've already got an account. But Brainworks plugins are awesome. Wow, these are great. You should definitely get these. 
Oh, the sub one? Oh, interesting. Okay, thank you for putting that in there. That's dope. Yeah, that's really, really good. Cool. All right. So, anyway, I'm going to quit out of Safari. And so that's the first synth that's the first electronic musical instrument. Uh, then what happened was later on, a bunch of years later, that thing that theremin had like it's kind of it came up. It got really popular. They actually had concerts at Radio City Music Hall. The Leon uh, theremin he came over to the United States. He lived in New York. He had people who uh, he had like an ensemble, like a group of people who played theremin and they did concerts and stuff because it's it's like. A classical instrument. You you play it. It sounds amazing. But um, uh, yeah, a lot. What what? Uh, okay. You could just do a search for uh, Tyrell N6 download. It's probably easier. Well, because I have to. I, I I'm gonna have to go do a search for Tyrell N6 <laughs> download, <laughs> like this N6. Download so it might as well cut out the middleman and you do the search for Tyrell N6 and just click on this first link here And then you can find it through there That's gonna be like download it from here, and then you just find the German the, and you'll just on the German page Okay, <clears throat> so what happened was uh, they uh, he, he had this and it kind of had its heyday and it kind of came back down and people had gotten excited about electronic instruments but then they kind of it kind of fell off. It wasn't, you know, some people were doing it, but it wasn't like popular culture stuff. Uh, and then this guy, Bob Moog, this guy right here, Bob Moog, he, um, he started making theremins in his garage when he was like in high school. He started making them again. He got really into electronic instruments and he was like, wow, this is super cool. How can I make this more accessible for, for everybody? And he realized that he could do other stuff with this. So he made... Uh, synthesizer uh, like this one here it's a little bit different this is a Voyager but he made the first synthesizers and you see this one behind him in the background here and he put a keyboard to it so people could play it more easily and that's when it really took off that's when this electronic kind of revolution took off um, also because the electronics started to get cheaper and cheaper and things got smaller and smaller and smaller then it became more practical for people to be able to have the stuff in their homes we can see here in this picture here let me just open up Safari again and we can see in this picture that uh, these things are huge so if we go over here we go Moog um, synth we do a search on images here. We can see this here. This is uh, this is what it looks like. Let me zoom in on that a little bit. There we go. So these are the first ones he, he kind of made. This thing is on a table. You can see here's a keyboard there. It's pretty big. This would be like over my head, this thing right here, just on from on the table. So they're about like three or four feet high. And it's it's huge. And if you put all the all the cables and stuff into it. Here, let's put Moog modular. Modular synth. Here we go. So we can see, and there's all sorts of different configurations. And the reason why there's different configurations is because these things are modular. Modular means they're different modules, and you can put the different modules in here. And if you need another module, you can just buy another module and you can stick it in here somewhere if you have room or you can add another rack into it. There's a lot going on with these and you can add more to it. And that's why, you know, that's kind of why they're so popular because you can do a lot of stuff to it. So a module is one of these right here. So you see, see this like this little area right here between these two white lines. This is a module and a module is like one piece and each piece does a part of the job for making the music and so if you say like let's say you want another thing that makes sound a thing that makes sound is called the oscillator you can add another oscillator in. that's a module the oscillator module and if you wanted another filter or if you wanted another envelope or an LFO all these different parts that make up the synthesizers this is what you can use you can you can just go out and buy another one um, they also like you can buy like uh, packages that, that have all the stuff in there but if you want to add more into it you can and we're going to come back and talk about modular synths again because they, they've had they're having a heyday right now again they've come back into popularity but we're going to talk about those 
a little bit later on. But these are what the first synthesizers looked like, was this one right here. And it had a whole bunch of different pieces, and Bob Moog had made, made these. And what happened was these famous keyboard players started using them. Uh, there was a, a keyboard player named Wendy Carlos, and she made an album called Switched on Bach. Switched on Bach is... Bach being played on a Moog synthesizer. And it sounds really, really cool. I highly recommend you do a search and you find it you switched on Bach. You can find it on YouTube. But that kind of made it really popular. It made the synth like people by like, wow, this is, you can, so expressive. You can do so much with it. It's super, super cool. And that kind of gave it some popularity. Uh, so that's kind of what happened. And then, and then what happened was somebody said, hey, can you make it smaller and more portable? And Bob Moog said, yeah, and he made the Mini Moog. And the Mini Moog is what really took off. The problem with these, uh, the, the modular synth is when you're touring with them, if you have them on tour, this big giant thing, first of all, you need like a team of people just to set this up and take it around with you. Uh, it's not very portable at all. Second of all, there, it's very um, like, what's the word, temperamental. So they kind of go out of tune really easily. Uh, they, they're like a real instrument. They break easily. Like you have to be really careful with them. And because they're so huge, it's hard to transport them around. So it's, uh, he, somebody said to him, hey, can you please make a synth that's more portable? And so then he made the Mini Moog. And the one that became famous was the Model D. <clears throat> And that looks like this. There we go. Boom. And it has most of the same pieces, but it's in a smaller thing. And you see it, it doesn't have all the cables. It's not modular, meaning you can't just add new parts into it if you want to. So what you have is what you get. So if you wanted to add another, another oscillator, another filter, something like that into it, you can't do it with this one. It's even though it looks way scaled down and doesn't look like that complex, you can make a lot of really amazing sounds with this thing. So it's it's an amazing synth. It's got a great sound to it. Uh, you can they did start they did reissue these a while back. They're like thirty five hundred, I think, or three thousand dollars or something like that. Um, there's a lot of other options on the market. Uh, we'll talk about those a little bit later. So, uh, but. Yeah, and so that's what we're going to be talking about now is kind of the non-modular stuff. We're going to talk about the modular stuff uh, later or tomorrow or something, but we're going to talk about the non-modular stuff more today. Let me quit out of this. There we go. Back over here. So there are different types of synthesis. There's additive and subtractive, frequency modulation, granular, wavetable, physical modeling. Uh, these are all the different types of synthesis. Now, a lot of these... Uh, are only really possible with computers. The only one that's really possible without a computer uh, really are the is the subtractive one, the frequency modulation one. Even though it did have, there was a keyboard version of it, and there was a keyboard version of the additive one as well. Uh, really, and, and wavetable also. I guess wavetable and subtractive are the two. You don't really need computers, but you need microchips for these other ones. Uh, subtractive synthesizers are basically using tubes and then filters to to take out the Mo, uh, the uh, harmonic frequencies, and we're going to talk about that. But the ones that were the 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 big modular synthesizers in the Mini Moog Model D, all those are all subtractive synths. Subtractive synthesis basically means that you start with a sound, and then you subtract harmonic frequencies out of it. And this synth here, the uh, the Tyrell N6, is a subtractive synth. And so what we're looking at here is I've got my oscillators that make the sound and I start with this sound over here. Let me go ahead and turn this one down. And you can see that as I turn this knob here, it changes the shape of my, it changes the sound. So if I start with this really bright sound over here, what I can do is I can use my filter over here to turn off the frequencies. And that's what we call subtractive synthesis. I'm actually subtracting out the harmonic frequencies. And if we go ahead and put in a, uh, here, let's put in an EQ in here. 
So let me just turn off this one and turn off this one. So we can just see what's going on here. We can see all the frequencies. You can see how bright that is there. I'm going to go ahead and leave that up over here. And I'm going to go over here and turn down my frequency right here. Get out of here. Hey, stop it. Stop it. Okay. There we go. As I pull this down, you can see all those high frequencies just fall off. I can bring them back up again. So you can actually see what's happening, but you can also hear what's happening. So that's subtractive synthesis. We're just subtracting out these high frequencies. If I wanted to change this, here I can change this, uh, this one, change it to a high pass, and check this out. Watch this. If I, if I have this as a high pass filter, I can actually get rid of those low frequencies. But what I'm doing is I'm getting rid of the frequencies, subtractive synthesis. So that's, that's what's going on with subtractive synthesis. These other types of synthesis, additive synthesis, is literally the opposite of subtractive synthesis, but it works in an interesting way where you take a whole bunch of sine waves and you kind of add them together to make different sounds. There's some really cool synths that are uh, additive synthesis, which we'll talk about later. Then you have FM synthesis, which is frequency modulation, where you're taking uh, frequencies and you're kind of smashing them together to create new frequencies. It's really complex, actually. Granular synthesis is where you're taking little snippets of sound and you're kind of running, you're kind of like taking a little, it's like kind of sampling in a way, but you're taking a very, very small part of the sample and you're using that to create your sound. Uh, and then you've got Wavetable, which has again kind of a, a sa sample or a sound in there and you're kind of you can scroll through it and then you got physical modeling which is one of the more uh, modern forms of synthesis which is actually using the math of physics to recreate real sounds uh, based on how they are in the real world so you can use it to recreate strings or bells or percussion or stuff like that it's not sampling, it's actually using math to recreate this stuff. It sounds really cool. It sounds like a hybrid of a real instrument and an electronic instrument. You can make it sound really cool and, and realistic, but you can tell that it's electronic, if that makes any sense. Um, again, I'll show you all that stuff a little bit later, but I wanna get into these different things of synthesis, the, the building blocks. So whenever we're talking about synthesizers, uh, there's a few key building blocks we've got to understand, and they make up the majority of all synthesizers. Even some synths that use different vocabulary, it's still kind of the same concepts. They're found in all types of synthesis, both analog and digital, and if you understand them, you'll know how to use most synthesizers. So let's just stop right here for a second and talk about analog and digital. So analog and digital basically Analog is using electricity to create the sound. Digital is using math to create the sound. So anytime you use anything on your computer, it is always digital. There's no such thing as an analog synth in your computer. There are analog emulations in your computer. But it's important to understand that they are not analog. They're, they are digital. And there's a real difference between digital and analog, although these days, the digital synthesizers have gotten really good at, at kind of recreating that analog sound. And so for, for most people out there, they really wouldn't know what they're listening to or they wouldn't care as long as they like the song. Um, <clears throat> but if you are using the synthesizers yourself, you can hear a difference and you can kind of tell a difference uh, when you're using analog versus digital. For one thing, the analog synthesizers, it's just nice to, to put your hands on a real synth, but that's actually not even the difference between analog and digital. There's just a certain sound to it that, that happens when it's all just analog. It's very smooth, everything is super, super smooth. There's no stepping through anything, there's no artifacts. The synth just works, it's awesome. Uh, I really love my analog synthesizers. I've got a few of them, and I've had various ones over the years. 
Uh, I'm a big fan of analog synths, obviously, but um, digital synths are also great. And I'm doing, like right now, while I'm traveling around, I'm doing everything with my computer. I don't have any of my analog synthesizers with me, and I can still make music just fine. I'm finding other ways to make cool sounds and do some things. So it's not, it's, don't let anybody tell you you have to have an analog synth to make cool music. You don't. What you have to have is a good ear, and you have to understand how the tools work so you can uh, use them correctly. All right, so let's get into this. So we've got a couple things here. Um, the VCO, the VCA, the VCF, the envelope, and the LFO. We're going to talk about these three parts first, the VCO, VCA, and VCF. Now, the VC part is the same for all of these. It stands for Voltage Controlled. And you don't have to really know what that means necessarily. Voltage control just means that it's using electricity to change the pitch or change the settings of something. So we can take off the word VC, voltage controlled. You can take it off. There are a lot of synthesizers that don't say VCO or VCA, VCF. They just say oscillator, uh, amplifier, or filter, which is the main important part there. You got the oscillator, you got the amplifier, you got the filter, then you've got the envelope, then you've got the LFO. Again, we're not going to talk about the LFO or the envelope right now. We're going to talk about these parts here. And as a matter of fact, let's start with the VCO here. So the voltage controlled oscillator is the primary building block of most synthesizers. Uh, this is the part of the synthesizer that generates the sound. There are many types and variations. So for example, in this synth that we've got right here, the oscillator is right over here. And there's actually two oscillators. And we can control the level of each oscillator with these faders right here. It's like, think of this as like a mixer. And different synthesizers have a different style of doing this. So some of them have faders like this. Some of them have knobs. Some of them have uh, a volume knob on the oscillator itself. There's different ones that do different things. But uh, for now, I'm just going to play one oscillator so we can just hear what the one oscillator sounds like. So this is the sound of the oscillator without being touched by anything else. Like that. Okay. And if I have a scope on here, I don't know that I have a scope on here. Let's see. I used to have an oscilloscope. Plugins. Do I have it still? No, and I forgot to, I meant to install it and I forgot to install it. Um, yeah, I don't have it on here. I want to show you what the, the wave shapes look like and I used to have a really cool one. Let's see if I can download one real quick. Well, I'd have to restart. Nah, I'll, I'll do it during the break. So basically, these shapes right here are the different shapes of your synthesizer. And this is, again, we're talking about, basically we're talking about subtractive synthesis right now. But the VCO goes to the speaker and it creates a sound like this. It generates a waveform. The waveforms have different shapes, sine wave, square wave, sawtooth wave, triangle wave, pulse, pulse width square, which is basically the same as a square, and then noise. So these are your basic shapes, and these create all the different sounds that we can get. So for example, and we can see, a lot of times they'll have like little pictures on here so you can see what the shape looks like. So this is a, uh, a triangle wave, basically a, a sine wave. There we go, there's a triangle wave, sorry. This is a sine wave, this is a triangle wave here. You can hear it's a little bit brighter. You can hear some of the harmonic frequencies creep in. There's a sine wave, there's a triangle wave. And once I go up, there's the sawtooth wave. And there's our, uh, our, um, our um, square wave. And for this one here, yeah, there's no, I actually don't know how to change the shape of the square wave on this one. I don't know if there is a way to change the shape of the square wave on this one. I guess there is, but I don't know what it is. Because it looks like there's an option here. Yeah. 
Let's see, is there a right click? It doesn't look like there's a right click on here. This one has, I can just click on it. But that's not gonna change my shape there. So, so some synthesizers have it. You can see this one doesn't have a way to change that shape, or at least I don't, I don't know what it is right now. Um, <clears throat> so these are the different shapes of your sound here. And this, this is like the starting point. And what we can do is this one here has two oscillators. So I could actually mix and match between these. So I could go here to this one here, put this one into a, a, a sine wave. go you can hear that and I can t I can tune between these I can turn this one all the way down and then we can use the filter to kind of shape everything off but right now uh, we're just dealing with these oscillators here you can choose that you can adjust the tuning on the second oscillator usually like that and then you can adjust the mix of these and the mix is really just a mix it's nothing fancier than just you just mix the two together and you're like okay i like that sound whatever we're good to go okay these are what the different uh waveforms look like sine wave square wave triangle sawtooth does it matter no it doesn't really matter um not for making music anyway it's it's nice to know what it looks like because there's pictures on things instead of uh, the words usually. It's just got a little picture of the waveform. So once you start to get used to this stuff, you can be like, oh, okay. And you can immediately get an idea for what it's going to sound like based on what it looks like. But you don't need to see this necessarily. It's interesting. Okay. So the sine wave is the most, most fundamental building block of all sound, really. Uh, it's the only it's only the fundamental frequency and it's a smooth sound and this is really good for sub bass So for example here, let's go ahead and turn this one down here put this back over to sine wave So if you want to make a sub This is this is how you'd make it Put that back up so we can hear it Right. Now you can hear that's a nice deep sub, but to make it more interesting, we really want to add some more stuff to it. So that's that's going to be after the synthesizer. Another thing I should add in here is that most synthesizers do not have effects. You'll find a lot of keyboards that have effects to make the sounds prettier and just make it work right out of the box. But a lot of analog synthesizers and a lot of the kind of like more specialized synthesizers do not have effects. They might have a chorus. Uh, some of them might have like a little bit of a delay, um, but for the most part, they're just dry. And if you want to make it sound interesting, you have to add effects later on. So very rarely in music production are you ever going to use a synth just by itself. Usually you're going to stick some kind of a EQ or a, a compressor or distortion or something after the synthesizer. But we'll come back and talk about that more later on. Okay, so that one is the sine wave and the square wave is one of the most useful ones because it's got a nice sound. It's not too abrasive, but it also has a lot of the frequencies in it. So we can actually do a lot with our filter over here, which we'll come back to in a second. Um, this one only contains fundamental and odd integer harmonics. Positive and ne the negative cycles are evenly spaced at 50%. And the positive is up top, the negative is down on the bottom here. And a pulse wave synthesizer, um, it's a square with a positive balance other than 50%. So I, let me here, let me pull up a different synth and I can show you what one of these would sound like. Let's grab the, uh, let's grab Diva. Diva's made by the same company. And uh, okay, so here's, let me move this over. Let's listen to this one. Okay, so this one's a little bit different. This one you can hear it's got some effects and stuff and I'm gonna turn off the plate. And I'm gonna go to a, here, let's down this, let's take you off. There we 
go. Put this all back to zero. There we go. And you can see this is basically the same thing. It's just, it looks a little bit different. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in here, I'm gonna grab this one. So there's a square wave. Right, and you can hear, that one sounds basically the same as this one over here. Let's go ahead and pull up the Tyrell N6 again. So this one here, uh, I know I can, here. here we go, here's what this one sounds like. That's what that square wave sounds like. And here's what this square wave sounds like. Let me turn that up. You can hear there's a slight difference in the tone, but they both sound like a square wave, basically. And so with this one here, I can actually get it easily to, to sound like a, to, to, to go into a, uh, like a pulse width. So what I'll do is I'll just take this and I'll move this up and you'll hear what it sounds like as it changes. It gets really thin. Right, and then over here is the sawtooth wave, I mean the uh, square wave which is like a bigger, rounder, fuller sound. So that's basically a sawtooth, I mean a, a pull, um, square wave versus a pulse width, width modulation. And you could do some really neat stuff with those. Okay, so moving the width shifts the harmonic series. You could hear it getting thinner. Pulse width is often modulated. So that means we can make it kind of do this, get wider and it will shift through things, which I can show you again later on. Then we have a sawtooth wave. Sawtooth wave contains both odd and even partials. It's a fuller, more frequency rich tone, ideal for subtractive synthesis. It's often stacked and detuned. So basically, uh, the sawtooth wave is the, what I, it's like the most obnoxious one. It's basically the one that like a lot of like EDM uses these sawtooth waves. Sawtooth wave in synthesis is kind of like candy uh, in food. It's like super bright, it's super in your face, kids love it, and it's super annoying. And it rots your teeth. <laughs> so this is what a, a sawtooth wave sounds like. There's the triangle wave. There's the sawtooth wave. Right, and so you can hear that big annoying sound there. Uh, I'm like it's a good it's a good starting point for some things. It's I don't really make a lot of I don't use it a lot, or if I do use it, I'll use it with like filters on it and stuff like that quite a bit. But uh, it's a really important waveform. And then the triangle wave contains only the odd harmonics, like a square wave, but it's not as bright as a square. It's very similar to a sine wave where it's like, there we go, there's that one. And then if I pulled this down, there's our, our sine wave. Let me pull that down a little bit, there we go. You can hear the difference better. Right, that, that's, the, that's the triangle wave. There's the sine wave. Uh, and then we've got a noise wave. Uh, this is all frequencies at the same volume, can be shaped or colored. It's useful for drum percussion sound effects, stuff like that. Um, this one does not have a noise on the oscillator over here. It's got a separate noise oscillator over here. So I can pull that up. So right now I'm playing my keyboard, you can't hear anything. But I can pull this up. And that's what noise sounds like. Noise does not have a pitch. It's just noise. But we can make it darker or brighter. And what noise is good for is, is kind of good for just adding in some stuff into the background of your sound.
I would add, you know, I, I'd like to add a little, little bit of noise into my synth patches. Just to kind of give them some character. And it's also nice when you add in some like distortion, stuff like that. So common parameters that we have for most of these are the waveform, select knob, uh, the amplitude, volume, pitch, coarse, fine, phase, shape, pulse width, sync, stuff like that. Uh, this synth does not have all of those. Let's pull up the other synth and see what that one has. So in here, you can see here's our, our range. The range is like your octave up, octave down. This is an interesting phenomenon. They actually do it like a pipe organ here in terms of feet. Two feet, four feet, eight feet, 16 feet, 32 feet. Even though there's no feet involved, uh, it comes from a pipe organ. A pipe organ, the longer the pipe, the the deeper the, the different octave it's on. So you'd have a pipe that's like 32 feet long, 16 feet long, eight feet long, four feet long, two feet long, that, like that. Um, there's no reason to call this in feet, but that's what uh, I think it came from Bob Moog. So some synthesizers do this, some don't. Just depends on the synth. Uh, but basically what this does is it puts the synth up an octave or down an octave. So, <coughs> excuse me. If I go in here and I arrange this, So we can hear the different octaves here. And then you see these down here have a detune knob. So what I'm going to do here, just show you what this does. So now we can hear both of them. I can move the octave up or down of this one. And I can detune it, which is like half steps. If you listen to classic techno or house music, you're going to hear a lot of that sound in there where it's very, uh, it's like that, that kind of my, uh, that, that perfect fourth. If you listen to Orbital, I don't know, maybe Carl, maybe you listened to Orbital back in the day, uh, but I was a huge fan of Orbital. They're like the first really famous techno band. Um, after the Prodigy. It was like the Prodigy and then Orbital. And uh, Orbital also does like, they've done some film soundtracks and things like that. This is like early, early 90s, late 80s. A lot of sounds like that. Now it should be said at this point that a lot of these synthesizers do not play chords. These can because they're digital. But if we go over here and put this in mono mode. Then you cannot play chords with it. And But this is a way to kind of cheat chords. It's not a real chord, but it is multiple notes. Um, Oh, okay, you never really listened to them. Yeah, you should check them out. They're really good. Uh, very musical, but techno. Um, so it's not a true chord. It's just one, I'm just playing one note at a time, but it's playing different pitches because I've got these, uh, I've got these um, oscillators detuned from each other. So let's go ahead and show you on this one here how we can make that happen. Turn that noise down. So I'm gonna pull both of these up. So here's here's the both of them. And what I'm gonna do is go ahead and tune this one. Uh, so here they are right in tune with each other. Turn it down.
All right, let me turn this to mono mode. Right, so you can get like a basic two things going on there. And what you would just do is you just tune them until it sounds pretty good. Like that sounds weird. That's an octave. Turn this up a little bit. So you can tune all the different things. And there's also really cool sounds that you can make by turn tuning them off a little bit from each other. It's, I mean, sound design can get really deep and there's all sorts of things that you can do with it. But this is like, we're just kind of the starting points of this stuff here. And then of course the sound changes. depending on what sounds your, your basic waveforms are. My bet is they create a lot of sounds for Nintendo with a physical synth. Uh, actually, they did not. Nintendo is uh, using the a synth built into the chip on the cartridge, or not on the cartridge, in the Nintendo itself. And this is uh, actually the basis for chip tunes music. It's um, so back in the 80s, there was a computer called the Commodore 64, and uh, the Commodore 64 had like a, a chip in it that could make sound. And that's basically a similar to what they used for Nintendo. It's 8-bit. The Nintendo original Nintendo was 8-bit. And it's this like kind of sound. Same thing with the Ataris. Because they couldn't sample the sounds, right? So they couldn't, even though the sounds sound like uh, from a physical synth, they sound like they couldn't sample those sounds. They couldn't record them in because recording takes RAM. It takes memory. And memory was super expensive in the 80s. So what they would do... It was they had this very, very limited sound set on these these chips inside the machine itself in the Nintendo. And nowadays, actually, people make music with that. It's called chip tunes. And it sounds super, super video gamey. Uh, it's, it's actually really interesting. I, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, if you like the way Nintendo is sounded, uh, you should check out chip tunes stuff. And you can also, you can also get like chip tunes synthesizers that recreate chip tunes stuff. Yeah, there's chiptune sounds, which is very similar to the Atari Commodore chips themselves. Don't know it's still. I I don't know if the ReFX one is, but there are ones out there that re, that basically just recreate that chiptune sound. Actually, if you have the full version of Reactor, you can get that as well. Um, yeah, some people. I, I had a friend who actually made chiptunes using. There was a cartridge you could get for your um, Nintendo Game Boy, and you could sit there and program the music on the Game Boy, uh, piece by piece by piece. Oh yeah, the OK computer, yeah, module and reactor. Yeah, and actually I think the OK computer one comes with reactor free the player possibly. We have to Yeah, you've seen it with the Game Boy. Yep. Yep, 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 the Game Boy uh you can like people program it and it's like insane because it takes so long to program on a Game Boy. It's not, you're not using a real sequencer like you are like Ableton Live or something and people do it. They sit there and they program this really complex stuff. And it, it had like a, a moment a few years ago where it looked like it was kind of gonna get a little bit popular and then it kind of fell off real fast. Um, it never really gained that high of popularity, but uh, yeah. But again, it's um, it's a definitely a sound, <laughs> and if you like it, you like it. And if you don't, you don't. I fall into the second category. Uh, all right. So 
Common parameters, yep. So the waveform select, so that's this stuff over here. The waveform select is right here. The shape, it's called shape sometimes. The tuning, you've got the tuning. You've got a mixer here. This is the mixer right here. This is all, like this This is the oscillator right here. The mixer is, I guess, kind of part of the oscillator section and it's showing, like, controlling the levels of things. And so with this mixer, I've also got a sub. which is an octave below this one here. Of course, the noise. <laughs> Carl. <laughs> it gets a little annoying when you heard it for like 30 seconds. I agree. I'm, I'm with you there, man. <laughs> but some people love it. Uh, then we've got this one here is interesting. The mixer actually has ring modulation and then a feedback section. So you can actually get a lot of really cool tones out of this thing. Like that. So you can get some really cool tones out of it. We're not gonna pay, we're not gonna really talk about the ring modulation or feedback section on this one because it's that's weird that it has it. Not a lot of synthesizers have this capability here for ring modulation or feedback, so we're not really going to go into that too, too much. But uh, that's that's what we're dealing with there. That's the, pretty much the oscillator section there. These are what some physical synths look like, some uh, modular synths. All that stuff there. Different software synthesizers. And there's, I mean, there's a whole bunch of them. So when, when we get to the end of stuff today, we can uh, go in and look at stuff. Oh yeah. Yep, Rubicon. I mean, stuff's great. It's so great. Uh, all right. And then you can see here's like some things pointing to your waveform select. Actually, Massive is a wavetable synthesizer. Uh, again, we'll come back and talk about some of that a little bit at the end here, so I can just show you some stuff. There's the pitches, pitch where you can control the pitch. There's your amplitude which is the mixer section for each one. And all these look different, right? You can see this one down here looks kind of similar to what we're looking at here with the um, Tyrell N6. All right, so the, uh, all right, so the VC part, voltage controlled, is just allowing parameters to be changed with control voltage. So a higher voltage equals a higher pitch, a lower voltage equals a lower pitch. With synth with software synthesizers, you don't have to worry about this at all. This is really just something that comes into hardware synth. So I'm going to skip over it for now because we're not really talking about um, hardware synthesizers. Okay, the amplifier. The amplifier is the way that we can turn the sound on and off that's generated by the oscillator. Uh, so its job is to keep the tone... To, the, 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 the oscillator is job is to keep generating the tone for forever. Just, it's just constantly generating that tone. Well, what happens is when you apply voltage, uh, you're going to turn on the amplifier. So we can shape the amplifier. So the amplifier goes in between the oscillator and the speaker. And so when we have this in here, once we use our key on a keyboard or something like that, it's going to open up the amplifier and the amplifier is going to let the sound pass through. It's really like a gate in that it stops the sound from passing through and then it opens to let the sound pass through. <clears throat> So usually a gate signal is used to open a, a, an amplifier. A MIDI keyboard with CV will send a gate signal when pressed. Gate does not contain pitch information about which note is pressed. That's a note, uh, a note number. So these are your amplifiers here. And basically, the amplifier in here is up here in our output, really. But then what we're doing is we're using this down here to control how that amplifier works. So we're going to come back to that. But essentially, the amplifier just lets the sound come through or not. The sound goes through. The sound doesn't go through. The sound goes through. The sound doesn't go through. When I press a key on my keyboard, it's going to tell that sound to go through. It's going to tell that gate to open up. Please open up. And the sound can go through. All right, the filter. Filter is used to take away frequencies to shape the sound. It's a key component to subtractive synthesis, and there are different types of filters. <clears throat> Low-pass filter, high-pass filter, 
Um, hey, what's up, Michael John? Uh, the band pass filter and the band reject filter. So you got the low pass, the high pass, and the band pass. Those are the main ones. And then you got band reject, which is also called a notch filter. Uh, it can be voltage controlled, whatever, but it can also be controlled with a whole bunch of other sources. And there's usually lots of different choices for these things, but it depends on the synthesizer. And this is what changes the, um, the kind of uh, the, the cost of synths and, and also the sound of a synthesizer is really based on what the uh, filter sounds like, what the filter is doing. So with your filter, They, the sound is completely different for different synthesizers. And let me just show you what I mean by that. So on here, let's see. I'm going to go back to the other one for just a second, just so I can show you some stuff here with this. If I go look at Diva, one of the things about Diva is that you can actually change out the different parts, the MS-20. Oh, my goodness. You're, 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 yeah, you're talking to my heart now. The MS-20 is one of my favorite synthesizers uh, for the filter. The filter on the MS-20 is amazing. I don't know if I have, oh, I actually do have the soft synth version from Korg of the MS-20. We can play with that a little bit later. It actually sounds really good for a soft synth. Um, it doesn't, obviously, it doesn't sound exactly like the MS-20, but they get it pretty close. It sounds pretty good. Um, the, and Ableton Live actually has a filter that's emulating that filter in the, um, in the MS-20 as well. It's, it's okay. Uh, it's not as good as the MS-20 uh, plug-in, but it's also not as good as the MS-20 synth cell hardware. The hardware is just so smooth. It's so great. So in here, though, we've got different types of filters. Here's the one filter. Let me go ahead and play this. Hold on. Let's make sure we're listening to the right one. Okay, I'm going to turn off the second. There we go. Here's this one. So here's what this filter sounds like. This filter is, I believe, just um, emulating a... Um, a Moog filter here and we've got these two here 12 and 24 so this is what this filter sounds like and here I'm gonna turn these off here because this is just you don't need to worry about this stuff don't don't pay any attention to any of the stuff down here right now just this cutoff frequency here And you can hear that's a nice, nice, smooth one here. Yep. So right here, you can hear what that filter sounds like. Now, if I want to change this out, this is, it's not modular exactly. It's like modular would imply that I could actually take the audio and route it around to different places. And we can't really do that. But what I can do is I can change out the filter right here and go to these different types of filters here. So you can see, here's a different filter. Let's hear what this one sounds like. Here, that one sounds different. And I also have this switch here, which it's hard to hear that difference, but there's a little bit of difference. Let me put that back. This one to me sounds like fuller than the other one. And then let's go down to multi-mode. This one is called multi-mode because we can switch around between these. And they have very different types here. And these here, the, the initials stand for, like it's abbreviation for what it is, low pass, high pass, band pass. So the low pass, what it does is it lets the frequencies through on the low end. So here, let me just show you a different, uh, different one here, Synth Basics. All the same stuff, but this is what the filters look like here. Low pass, high pass, band pass, and notch, band reject. The green represents the frequencies that we hear. So the low pass is letting the low frequencies through. The high pass is letting the high frequencies through. The band pass is letting all the middle frequencies through. And the band reject is actually uh, rejecting these frequencies. So it's on either side. So if I go in here and I switch these, the low pass, we're going to hear the low frequencies. And if I pull it up higher, we're going to hear those high frequencies come in. Right? If I go to low pass two, it's cutting off less of the high frequencies. 
Hear how that one's like a darker sound? That one's a brighter sound. Like that. And then my high pass is gonna cut out the low frequency. So if I start down here, we can hear everything. And now all the high frequencies, all the low frequencies get taken out. And then the band pass, it lets frequencies in the middle come through. And we can boost those frequencies using the resonance here, but we'll come back to that resonance knob. We're not quite there yet. And then let's go down here to the bite. One. And again, you can hear this one. Sounds very similar to the uh, other ones, but let's go ahead. And... Oh man, listen to that one. That's nice. That's interesting because it's like a... It's like getting rid of these low frequencies, but it's like, yeah. Interesting, that's a really interesting filter there. I, I don't really ever use that one that much. I should. And the UB. Yeah, the curves are definitely different on the bite one. I actually don't use it much either. I don't I don't really mess around with these last two filters on here very often. <laughs> what I always recommend you do when you're trying out your filters and you're experimenting with stuff is you kind of I, I recommend you program in something into the DAW. Let's go ahead. And then you just go through and you just mess with stuff in here. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I never owned F Zebra. It's like, I always felt like I should have gotten it and then I felt like I missed the boat and then I just like, all right. Right, so we can change these filters as we go. And we can hear what the different filter types sound like. Hear how different that one sounds? Let me put it in 12 dB. There we go. See hear how big and fat that is? And all we're doing is changing the filter. Nothing else has been changed over here. So let's go ahead and, and, and use this uh, Tyrell N6 here and you can hear the filter on there. The filter on the Tyrell N6 is interesting because it's a slightly different, uh, it's like a different vibe going on with it slightly with this over here. It's, in, it's interesting because it's got this high pass, low pass mode here and you can switch between them using this fader right here. So let's go ahead, down as, as low pass mode. Put this into a, I'm gonna put it into my triangle mode. You can hear immediately, it's definitely not as rich as the other ones. Right, and then if I move this up here, it's gonna be a high pass mode. And then you can put it in the middle. And it's like a band reject. And then you've got the band pass filter which this doesn't matter. Oh. It does change the sound slightly. That's interesting. Hear how that sounds? Feels like it's still got a little bit of a boost on the high end with this, even in bandpass mode. So, so you can hear, basically my point is that all filters are not created equal. Uh, different filters sound differently, and that's why you should be paying attention to all the different parts of your synthesizer, even when it's like got different filters and stuff like that going on, because everything does change the sound, even if it's slightly, and these things make a big difference. Uh, let's go back to our notes over here. So the, the VCA comes after the filter. Wait. Uh, filter type. Okay, we this didn't really talk about the cutoff frequency here, so let's go back to the other one here and talk about this cutoff, uh, not the frequency, sorry, the um, 
the uh, the resonance here. So the, the frequency cutoff adjusts where the filter will cut the frequency. So for example, if we look at our Pro-Q3, we can see it's, it's cutting the frequencies. So you can see our, our frequencies are up, up high. We can see them all. If I, there we go. So we can cut all those frequencies out here. You know, we can pull them back in. So I can make the sound darker or brighter, and we can actually see it happening right there. Well, the resonance creates a peak where that filter cutoff is. So my filter cutoff is right here. This is the frequency where it's cutting the signal. And if I put a resonance, if I turn the resonance up, you can see this bump right here. You can see that bump? That's where, that, that's where the frequency is at, and that's the resonance. And the higher I put the resonance, the more that bump is going to happen. And again, just like with the different sounds of the, freak, of the filters, different resonances operate differently within the, within the synth. So for example, let's go back and look at the other ones here for a second. Because one of the things that was really common with the Moog synthesizers was that the, uh, the, the more you cranked the resonance, it actually cut the low frequencies out of the, out of the, out of the synth. Uh, which is an interesting thing, and it took—I didn't really understand that for a while. I thought my—I thought my Moog synth was like I had like an old, an old uh, Moog from Radio Shack, actually a realistic synth. I still got it. I don't use it. I don't plug it in anymore. But I thought it was broken. I had no idea how these things worked because I just didn't know what I was doing, right? So <clears throat> um, once I learned about that, I was like, oh, okay. So here's this one, and. You hear when I increase the emphasis, which is the resonance, it cuts that low frequency out. Yes, that's what I mean. <laughs> the attenuation of the resonance peak on Moog uh, filters. I don't, I don't know all the fancy words, I'm sorry. But yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. It basically, it basically pulls the sound back so it's not quite as deep and rich as it was when you boost this emphasis. But different filters do not act like that. So if I... So this one here... It doesn't really... doesn't really do the same thing. And it's also one of the... Th it's also one of the things that I really love about the... Um, uh, yeah, exactly. That's also one of the things that I love about the MS-20 filter, which I don't, this doesn't look like it has an MS-20 filter in here. Oh, wow. Goodness, sorry about that. But you can hear like different resonances operate differently on these different synths. <clears throat> Let's hear what this one. So, cool stuff. It's definitely something you need to play with and mess around with. Um, I do not have my UAD plugged in right now, but one of my favorite filters in the whole world is the Moog filter that UAD makes. It's an amazing filter. It sounds unbelievable. I highly recommend, if you haven't played with it, if you have UAD stuff, you need to check it out because it's one of the best filters that I've ever heard of, or ever heard. Um, but just to show you the filter with Ableton Live, if you have Ableton Live, if you're using it, I'm going to turn this all the way up. And so we're not going to use the filter in here at all. We're going to actually put the Ableton Live filter in here. Oh yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Thank you for reminding me about that. Yes. Let me, let me show you that one as well. Um, 
But the one that comes with Ableton Live, auto filter, is also fantastic sounding these days. Ever since Live, like 9.6 or something. Really good filter. And you can crank that resonance up. Let me turn this down a little bit. Right, the clean version has a great sound, but then they've also got these different filter types in here. Right here, we can change the filter type. So you got the MS-20, you got the PRD, which I believe is the Moog one, SMP, which is, I think this one is the, um, the Dave's, uh, the Oberheim, or it might be this one is the Oberheim. I don't remember, but you can hear the differences in the filter tones. Like this MS-20 is not as good as the real thing. But it does resonate nicely. It gives a nice sound. But then the other cool thing about this is you can push the drive into it, which I like a lot. You get it to... Really thicken, thicken that sound up. Get a nice rough, rough tone going on. So it's it's actually me. It's actually it's not a bad filter for something that comes with it. But then, as you said, CMDR. <clears throat> yeah, almost, right? Um, almost. But there's no there's no formant shift on here. Uh so but like you said the Simplon is dope. And this one's cheap. Uh, if you if, if you're a student, if you're one of my students, you can actually send them an, um, uh, an e email and get a student discount for stuff and it brings this filter cost down to like probably 10 bucks or something. Super worth it for $10. And then you've got these different ones here. Let me turn this one off. Different filter types in here. And again, you can adjust the input gain to overdrive it. You got the peak. Do some really neat stuff with this. You know, and you've got different filter types over here. So this is a great one. The other thing that's that I like about it is you can actually set these up like this in the middle and you can grab and kind of mess with that. And then if you have live suite, what you could do is you can actually uh, adjust the, uh, I'm not gonna do it right now. Actually, I was gonna do it, but I'm, I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna stop myself. Uh, you can actually use a, a, an LFO to adjust these and do some cool stuff with it as well. So lots of different filters out in the world. Um, so, so much cool stuff out there. Uh, what's this filter shaver? Is this? Oh, this is Cable Guys. Yeah, Cable Guys. This is another one that's really neat. This is the demo version. I, I should buy this. I um I just use this demo version because it gives it's limited. But what's neat about it is you can do some cool stuff. It's got like a a shaper in here, and then you could just do some really neat stuff with it. Why are we not? There we go. There we go. Let me go back over here. But it's a, it's a neat, it's a really neat filter. I thought I owned this one actually. Maybe I never bought this one. I like Cable Guys a lot. If you haven't messed with Cable Guys stuff, you, you're missing out. Cable Guys is, is great stuff. 
Um, all right, anyway, we can get sucked in that hole for a long time. My point is with all this stuff is there's like a lot of different variations. So don't discount it just because the filter is not the part that makes the sound. The filter is a big part of the sound and different filters do different things. So don't just like have one filter and be like, that's it, I'm done with filters. For, for No, definitely not. You're not done with filters. You definitely need to be working with filters uh, and like getting lots of different filters, especially if you're doing sound design stuff. Okay, and finally the slope. You've seen on these here, the slope, uh, for example, on you know, this one here, Tyrell N6, you can see here, there's this one here where it says VCF poles. It's the same thing as the slope. The higher the number, the more sharp the cutoff, which cuts off more of the frequencies on the other side. So for example, if we're in uh, low pass mode right here, low pass mode, wait, you stop, you play. So if we're playing this sound here, and I move it down like this, if I change this to 12, 24, 36, it's going to change the sound. Oh, the strobe synth. I should reinstall those. I have an old, I have a, like I, I've had them forever. And that's a good idea actually, just for the filter. It's a really good idea. So here's listen to these poles here. You can hear it's cutting off more of the frequencies, making it darker, but I haven't changed this right here. And that's because it's a, it's a quicker cut. And so if we look at this with our, this one here, see how it's like a gentle slope down. Here, let me go ahead and just play this. If I adjust my filter, type let's put this down here check this out see how it cuts off more of the frequencies right there and then put the 36 even more and that's what it's doing it's actually a sharper cut where that frequency point is so let me put it back to 12 and you'll see those jump up again see that how much that jumped Right. So you can hear it, but it also kind of helps to see it. It took me forever to really understand what the poles do, do or the slope. Uh, different scents call it different things. Some call it a slope, some call it the poles. Um, but it's basically how much decibel cut there will be per octave of frequency beyond the cutoff. So a 12 dB one has 12 dB decibels of cutoff beyond the uh, per octave beyond the cutoff point and the 24 has 24 decibels and the 36 has 36 and there's even more like for example if we go look at this fab filter here the fab filter has poles on it as well even though it's not a filter it's an eq but if i put a high cut in here we adjust the frequency here you can see if i change this to six it's a more gentle slope and if i change it to 12 and then 18, and then 24, and then 30. You can see there's all these options where you can actually get to 96, which is pretty much straight, but then they have another one in here called brick wall, which is literally just straight. And one of the cool things, yeah. <laughs> One of the cool things with the fab filter stuff is even though it's not a filter per se, it's an EQ, it actually has a Q here. Oh wait, I'm, I've got, hold on, we're not going to hear a whole lot of change if I've got the filter on this thing down. Here, let's put that back up. There we go. There we go. So we can see all this stuff and we can actually move it through. Now the Pro Q3 is not designed to act like a filter. It's it's not um here we go. It's not uh it's not musical sounding, it's very uh, surgical and precise, uh, which makes it a great EQ for doing precise things, but it's not like as musical as a filter. And that's really the difference. People say, like, what's the difference between a filter and an EQ? Because an EQ can do a lot of the same things a filter can do and vice versa. But filters have things like, if we look here, just the filter, let's go grab uh, our auto filter here. 
the auto filter has on some of these, we've got a drive knob here which increases the input into it and it distorts, it has a nice musical distortion. Uh, it's got, it's a little bit, like you can attach LFOs to it or envelopes to it to make it more musical which we're gonna talk about here in a second. So it's like a filter is like a musical EQ is what I say, but EQs are really, they're different, they serve different purposes. The filter is attached to some kind of a musical instrument usually, whereas the, uh, the filter, yeah, whereas the EQ is something you use to kind of maybe fix problems with the mix and kind of carve out things and, and adjust frequencies so that they, the various instruments fit well together. Whereas a filter, um, generally a filter on a synth is for kind of augmenting the sound of that for a more musical sound. And that's kind of really the difference between them. You could use some EQs as a kind of filter type of thing, but really if you want to use an EQ, use an EQ. And if you want to use a filter, use a filter. They're not really, they're not really the same thing, although they are related to each other. All right, where are we? Yes, 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 yes. Modulation, hold on, let's go back over here to this one here. Okay, so this is the kind of the home stretch of our sense and we're gonna take a break. We are talking about the modulation section. Now the modulation section, section is our envelope and our LFOs. These do not touch the sound. This is so important. They do not touch the sound. The sound is, let's go back here a little bit, just show you this. Here we go. Here's the sound structure of stuff. Oscillator into the filter, into the amplifier, into your speakers that we can listen. That's the sound. So the sound is generated here by the oscillator, goes into the filter to get the frequency subtracted out, and then it goes into your amplifier so they can turn it off and on. This is what touches the sound right here. The next part is the LFO and the envelope these kind of sit outside of the signal flow and they control parameters in the oscillator and the filter and the amplifier, but they do not actually touch the oscillator, the filter, the amplifier sound. They don't actually touch the sound being generated or going through it. And that's a really hard concept to understand. And I, I completely am with you if it takes a while for you to wrap your head around this. It took me forever to wrap my head around this. But the LFO and the envelope, they adjust things that change the sound, but they do not touch the sound themselves. So what do I mean by this? Well, for example, an easy example is to say that I want to adjust my pitch of my, of my sound. So here's this one. Let me make it a little bit less annoying. Yeah, they're time-based control parameters, exactly. So here it says my uh, pulse uh, pitch wheel source is, okay, let's put this up. Let's turn this one, let's see if we can do this. Can I do it here? I don't, oh, here we go. Let's see. I don't know how to do it on this one, actually. Mod wheel source, gate. Let me put this to none. Can I make this go up? Hmm. I can't remember how to do this one. That should be doing something now, but I can't. Oh, wait, this one? Ah, wait, hold on a second. Let's put that back to mod wheel. Nope. I don't know how to do it on this one, actually. <clears throat> well, here, I'll show you with a different thing. Let's show you with the uh, oscillator, with the filter here. And also, let me turn this, get rid of this, and turn you off. Oh, no, you're not on. Okay, well, here, let's get rid of you anyway. Here we go. Okay, so here, let's put this back to a bright sound and use the uh, uh, LFO <clears throat> on this cutoff here. So what I'm gonna do here is LFO one here. Let's set LFO one over here. None. Why 
are we not? Why is it not me? Do I have to hit play? Hold on a second. I don't ever, I don't really program this one. So this stuff here, I might just show you in a different synth here in a second. Not sure why that's not doing anything. Okay, so that's not doing something because of that. But, huh. Yeah, I thought that should be doing something. Sorry, y'all. All right. Well, it's kind of, hold on. Fun with synthesizers. Source on the middle button on the LFO. I shouldn't have to, should I? I've got a gate restart. I don't think I should have to specify a source. I should have my rate. My modulation, no. Depth modulation, no. And it's triggering when I let go of the key. <laughs> Whatever. All right, we're gonna we're gonna stop right there with that one, and go to over here to Diva. I think I know how to program Diva. <laughs> okay. Here's this, and let's go in here. Let's attach this to our LFO here. Okay, much better. That's that. That makes sense. Okay, <laughs> so here's my here's my source of what what I'm gonna use. I'm gonna use the LFO. We're not gonna use the envelope two right now. We're gonna use the LFO two. LFO two is where's LFO two? Right over here. Okay, so here's this. I can adjust my rate. Right. So let's let's have this go on to our pitch actually. Yeah, so I'm going to take this off of there. Let's go over here to this one, and let's turn this on. Although, hold on. Let's turn this off of here. Wait, no, not you. Let's put you on to LFO2. There we go. That's what I was trying to do all along. There we go. So you can hear, this is what the LFO is doing. This is like the easiest way to hear it, is what I've got is I've got the LFO is attached to the pitch over here. And now I can adjust my rate right here, and that's gonna be how fast we're going up and down. I'll turn this to... And you can make it super slow here. I can adjust it to 10 seconds. So slow. You can hear it creeping a little bit. All right. And I can also adjust it to be like part of my sync with my song as well, which is where, you know, dubstep. Um, so if we go in here and I can say, all right, Yeah, we're talking about chip tunes before, right? And I can also change my waveform, and the waveform is going to change what it sounds like here. So if I want it to be like a square, now it sounds like a European ambulance, and I can make it faster. Like like the ship's going to explode. Why is it drifting? <laughs> I feel like I, I did something to something and... 
Not sure why we're drifting here. But anyway, uh, we can hear that this is what our LFO is doing. And we can attach this LFO to different parts of our sound. So for example, right now it's attached to the pitch. I'm gonna turn that off. Let's attach it to our uh, amplifier here. Uh, actually, actually, I don't know how to attach it to the amplifier on this one here. So let's attach it to our filter. And we're gonna go over here to LFO2, there we go. So this one's already like set to LFO2. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold it down. And the more I adjust this is the more that LFO is going to affect my cutoff. And I can adjust my speed right over here. On the amplifier pan, you can set the source for the LFO. Oh, sweet, thanks. There we go, cool, so let's do that. Let's adjust this over here. There we go. So my volume knob, there you go, and I can adjust this. So you can do that there with the amplifier, and then we can also do it with our filter, which we were just doing. And with the filter, you know, I'll put this back in the middle, back to zero. Adjust this here, or you can go down. We can adjust our emphasis, which is our, our frequency. Now, the thing about this is that All these these different knobs kind of work in conjunction with each other. And so you have to be, it's like a balancing act to really set up your modulation sources in your destination. The balancing act comes from the actual uh, setting here and then over here and then down here as well. It's like three different places we're kind of messing around with this stuff. So let me just show you how this would work. Let me go ahead and program this into my Ableton Live real quick. Configure uh, you, you, you and you okay so now with my controller I can just control these things so I've got my frequency here and I've got my resonance here I've got my LFO amount here and I've got the uh, rate over here so we can we can actually see those on my screen here kind of moving around I'm not I, I don't want to use the mouse and so I'm gonna hit play on my little thing here Why did my tuning go off? Oh, it's over here. Oh, it's pre I did this. That's there we go. <laughs> I was like, why? <gasps> okay. No, you're still. Oh, it's that. No. What did I do? <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Put you back. Detune on my oscillator too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> But why is that changing it like over time like that? That's weird. Okay, hold on. Let's grab a, hold on. This is, and this is like, like real world. Like when you, sometimes you get things going and you're just like, oh, wait, hold on a second. What? All right. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Okay, so here's our filter. And our LFO2 here, like this. So I think we're still, there's the peak. Okay, cool. There we go. So you can hear, as I, as I go, if I've got these assigned to knobs on my keyboard, I can change the sounds really quick. So I go in here, it's adjusting my rate down here. Now it's, it's restarting the LFO every time I hit a note. So I'm gonna turn this into a uh, single, so it just plays. So now the LFO is kind of moving through everything. And as I adjust this down here, I can also adjust my amount. So I'm using my cutoff frequency here to make it brighter or darker in general. 
but I can also make the LFO affect the brightness or darkness more by turning this knob right here. Right? And then I can adjust the speed by going down here my rate. I want to be brighter overall. Maybe I don't want very much, like, amount, but I can adjust the speed. And you can hear, we can get into some pretty cool sounds. Right. Some pretty cool sounds without a whole lot actually happening. I've literally only got, I've literally only got the LFO attached to my, uh, my, free, my filter and that's it. And it's got a really, really cool sound right there already. Just a really neat little sound. So this is this one here. And uh, that's, that's our LFOs. And, and LFOs, there's usually two LFOs. Sometimes there's more. Uh, depends on the synthesizer. And this is another place where different synths kind of do different things. Um, you have more or less LFOs, envelopes, stuff like that. Finally, let's talk about our, our envelope here. Now the envelope, I'm going to go ahead and get this one down all the way. Turn you right down. So, so now, yeah. Now the uh, the there we go. Okay. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to hear the sound. When I play it, you can hear how it just starts and stops really quickly. Well, the envelope. What happens is the envelope. Uh, it starts when I hit the key. When I hit a key on the keyboard, it starts. As I hold the key, it continues to hold the envelope. And then when I let go of the key, it releases the envelope. And it's gonna reset the envelope back to its beginning state. And I can attach this envelope to lots of different things. So for example, right now, my envelope is right up here. And it's an ADSR envelope. That stands for Attack, Decay, Sustain, Release. And the sustain is right here. So what I want to do, if I just want to have the sound just kind of play as I hold the key down on my keyboard, I put my sustain all the way up. And you can hear when I release the key, it actually just cuts off the sound. It starts it and it stops it and that's it. But if I wanted it to slowly die off, I can put this release up. So if I hold it down, it's just gonna hold it. And if I let go, it releases it slowly. If I wanted to have it start slowly, I can put my attack up. So that's what these these do here. The ADSR envelope, let me just go ahead and put it here in the notes for you, show you the notes. It's, it's time and level. So attack is time, decay is time, sustain is level, and release is time. When you press a key, a note on message is sent. When you release it, a note off message is sent. And the envelope is what happens from when the time when you press the key to the time you release it, and a little bit after that. So if I have... If, imagine that this right here is how long I hold the note. Right here, note on and note off. When I press the key on my keyboard, it's note on. When I release the key, it's note off. So when I press the key, we're kind of chilling down here. <coughs> We've got 100% on, which is our maximum volume level, and 0% on, which is silence. And we start off at silence, and when I press the key on my keyboard, it takes time to go up to 100%, and that's the attack time. The time when it takes to go from zero to 100% of the level is the attack time. Now, as I hold down the key, that's my sustain level. If I change that sustain level, I'm gonna put this down here. See here how it's like louder and softer? 
This is like a percentage of that all the way loud. Right, so my sustain is at 100%, it's just gonna be loud. But if I put my sustain down to 50%, now what happens is, you can hear there's a little pop on the beginning. If I adjust this decay time, Yeah, there's like a little pop on the beginning. If I hit play, there's like a little pop there. If I turn my sustain all the way down, it's just gonna be this decay. And the decay is the time it takes to get from that 100% down to the sustain, whatever that sustain is set to. So if I have my sustain set all the way up here, that decay doesn't do anything. Nothing happens. But if I have my sustain down here, we're gonna hear something happening with that decay. And if I turn my decay up long enough, it's gonna be a really long decay time, so it's gonna sound like a sustain. Usually you're not gonna turn that decay up quite that long. Okay. And then when I release the note, it goes back to its home, back to zero. And that's the time, the release is the time it takes to go from here to down to zero. So, for example, if I have my sustain all the way up, if I have my sustain all the way up, and I put my release, it takes time to get back to zero. Luna, come here. Luna, hey. Come here, babe. Dog is freaking out about people who are already here. Come here. Oh, you want to play with your toy? No? Hmm. All right. So anyway, uh, that's our release. So for example, if I wanted to, if I wanted to like that, I can let go, and it will, it will do the release thing like that. Come here, base. Come here. All right. Yeah. There you go. There you go, babes. Yeah. Oh, you're so cute. My dog is the cutest dog. Ah, rah, 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 rah. Slowly teaching her to not be annoying. Yeah, good girl. There we go. So that's what the release does. The release goes from whatever our sustain level is back down to zero. All right, in here. And all the synths have this stuff in here. It's just a matter of finding it. So for example, we've been using Diva here because that was just what it was easiest to, sh to set the uh, that, that LFO. But let's go over here to our envelope and get Tyrell N6 out. So I've got, hold on. Hold on, we're gonna, we're gonna reset the sound. <laughs> you know, let's just go to Chapter three. That's a cool sound. And it's got the uh, LFO attached to the sound. <laughs> Why couldn't I get that to work? There's probably something I was missing there. Anyway, I'm going to just turn these down. Whoops. Oh no, I can't get it to stop. Great. None. All right. There we go. Cool. Okay, so you can see our different down here what's going on. So I'm going to go ahead and turn. Oh wait, these are supposed to be in the middle, that's why. There we go. I'm gonna turn this off right now so it's not affecting anything. Now if I wanna set my if I wanna set my level here, my overall sound, if I want to go just on and off, so I can just do like this. Alright, let me 
adjust the mono mode. Yeah, mono, there we go, drift off. Cool, okay. So what I, what I wanna do, if I wanna make this so it kinda of hits and then let's go like a pluck sound, I'll turn my sustain all the way down and put my attack, my, my sorry, my decay, my release up. So you can hear how that works there. Now let's go ahead and put like a little bit of a, make it kind of dark right here. And we'll use this one again, the ADSR2, which is our second envelope. To give it a little bump in the beginning, put this all the way down as well. A little tiny bump. So you can hear how we get the sound. Kind of has like a little pluck on the beginning. Gets and it gets darker as it goes. And so that's just a real quick way that you can uh, do some sound design there <clears throat> with all these things we just kind of uh, mess with and that's how the envelope works as well. Now another thing about what I just did is that it's also showing you how we can use what we learn here today to kind of shape sounds in general. I don't expect for you to be making amazing sounds from scratch right now. That's what presets are for. Presets are awesome and you can you can you know you definitely use presets as a good starting point but um, what we can do is we can say, okay, I like this starting point of the sound. Now what I wanna do is I wanna shape it using my knowledge of how the oscillators work, how the filter works, how the envelopes all work together to kind of take the sound and tailor it to my own like desires. And that's what all this stuff is uh, doing here. Uh, there's some more notes in here about uh, routing. How do they connect the modulation sources with their destinations? Different synthesizers handle it differently. Sometimes the source will have menus to select the destination. Sometimes the destination will have a modulation amount knob on it. You really have to kind of read the manual. You have to kind of like look at your synthesizers and, and like and learn how they work because different ones do it differently. Um, <clears throat> some have a modulation matrix, which is kind of like usually sits in the middle of things and shows you different stuff. Some of them use kind of like a combination of different ways to do it. They're all different. And so you really have to just kind of like see what your synth is doing. Oftentimes the trickiest part of understanding a synth is learning how it does modulation. As you could see, uh, that Yuhei, uh, this Tyrell N6 was acting a little bit weird with the modulation for me with the LFO. So I just, I went to a different synth. If you really needed to get something done, then you're gonna have to you're gonna have to go through and learn how to do it <clears throat> and like you saw with me i was like i'm i'm done you know spending my time on it so i just went to a synth that i know a bit better but uh anyway let's go ahead and stop there